Welcome to episode 35 of Building Blocks. Brennan, today we're with Ron Glosman, a serial entrepreneur starting organizations such as Note, which many of us may have used during your university career to help us consolidate our notes, as well as Chisel AI, which has redefined the insurance industry. So on today's episode, we talk about a variety of different things. How it is to start a business and really be a serial entrepreneur. One of the really important factors we talk about is how having a business go from zero to five employees, five to 10, 10 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 plus, all require a different set of leadership styles, but most importantly, change of structure. One of the things we really touch on is how that a business or a process that works at five employees may not work at 50 employees and that things have to change. Just like progressing through your career, progressing through life, will work in the past may not work in the future. And we speak with Ron about how he's had to adapt some of his styles, but most importantly, what is different from running a small organization or a startup to running a mid-sized organization. We also talk about really finding that I hate to say like work-life balance, really how Ron's priorities has changed throughout his career and throughout his life to really help find a balance. One thing we speak about is that, you know, creating a business and creating this journey, it, it is a marathon, not a sprint. So figuring out, finding time to really enjoy life as well as have success is a very important balance that can be something that's difficult to find. Hope you guys enjoy this episode, learn a bit more about what it means to be an entrepreneur, really what it is to be a serial entrepreneur, really how you can really change your organization as you grow as well as really what AI is and some of the buzzwords and really what it means. A lot of times when you hear AI, a lot of times it can really not be useful, but a lot of times it is useful. So we really talk about the balance between using AI in an organization and the importance behind it and when it is useful rather than just having a simple mat matching algorithm. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Check out Ron and some of the future products you should be working on and subscribe to the podcast. So my name is Ron Glosman. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm a passionate uh, tech geek. I love to talk about AI, computer science, machine learning, all things finance, insurance, real estate, and really um, how to build great businesses. Because I've I've done a couple, and I've also built many unsuccessful businesses, which I'm happy to talk about as well. For sure. And one of the things that you tend to hear a lot is like serial entrepreneur. What I guess in your words, you probably get a lot. Like, what do you define entrepreneur as? Like, is there a there's a, people have so many different definitions. But like, what would you can because you self-categorize as self-entrepreneur, you know, so you're an entrepreneur. What would you categorize an entrepreneur as? I think anybody who takes a risk, it doesn't have to be necessarily a novel idea or anything new. I think there's a lot of mom and pop entrepreneurs like running a corner store or a gas station. All of those businesses still need to be profitable. And I think a lot of people get mi the misconception that you have to have a VC backed business and it has to raise millions of dollars and this and that. But that to me is like a very small chunk of the whole like entrepreneurship pie which consists of primarily very very successful mom and pop businesses that probably make up the majority of it yeah and that's the funny thing it's i think it's similar to the idea that like every time you tech, like talk to a lot of successful people you always think it's like okay everyone's going to be like a 20 year old tech billionaire and then you talk to most like high successful most successful businesses are started later in life and most of the people who have relatively high amount of wealth could be like a reseller could be like like you said mom pop store could be like a car distribution so like they're not it's not always like this glamorized tech and like i mean obviously there's a ton of money there but like you said a lot of ways to be an entrepreneur some are more popular and i guess sexier more publicized than others but there's so many different ways of like making money and making a business that can be self-run uh and really on an entrepreneur um one thing that's kind of you know interesting about you is you obviously your your background tech focus computer science and business so kind of mixing of both worlds from a young age were you like pretty tech focused in yourself like were you really into programming gaming or like kind of how did that how did you get started in like your niche or like within the tech world it's interesting because i think as a young kid i went through the the typical phase of like lawyer doctor or whatever like all that stuff um, but I always did like playing video games and I, I initially thought I wanted to make video games. Mm -hmm. So I got into programming, but I very quickly learned like game development is not the type of development that I like to do. Cause there's many, 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 many different mm -hmm. types of software and they like there's hardware, mm -hmm. which is like, is something that I I'm terrible at. I aspire to be good. Cause I think it's definitely the hardest because mm -hmm. you have to make a world in the, make it work in the physical world mm -hmm. and make it work in the software world. Um, but I think I was always passionate about computers. I think it got started through video games. I was lucky to go through a special program where I learned computer science in grade nine. 
Um, I got, I went through AP courses by the time I went to university, I already knew like three or four programming languages. I had a lot of experience. I went through co-op. And so, um, I've been coding for at this point, like 15 years, I want to say. So it's been a long time. Yeah. What's really funny about your story is that I started programming when I think I was like 12 or 13. Like my dad was like, programming is the future. This is fun. And similar to you, I started off like. Visual Basic, making Pac-Man, then C Sharp, C++, like JavaScript, Python, like all these other things to make video games. Like every, I guess, kid in high school, I'm like, I'm going to become a game developer. I'm going to go work for Ubisoft or out, out in Vancouver and work for EA. Until I realized that uh, programming day-to-day is not like creating. There's like a lot of like very technical <laughs> focus. You're not making up games. Typically, when you start out your job, it's like, hey, write this class, do this, this is your role. I also learned that... um like you said, there's many different types of programming. So very quickly, I learned, I guess, similar to you, I was like, okay, well, different. But like, I was like, programming probably isn't for me. Like, I like creating and developing businesses, but programming is a different subset. Obviously, at the highest level, you can do both. And I also learned I was okay at it, but not great. I think that's a key also. You have to figure out what you're great and passionate at. So much so that, like many others, first year university, um, I, did, like, I did programming for like five, ten, like five years. I thought I knew my stuff didn't study for the exam, pass fail exam. I'm like, oh, it's just like Python. I, it's similar to other languages. I forgot that syntax really matters when it's a <laughs> handwritten exam. So I didn't do well in that course. And I learned that, okay, maybe there's levels to this. And from there, that was my last day programming, but I'm happy at least have that knowledge. Although looking back, I wish I did stick with it, but it's kind of funny how you said the same thing when you're like, I'll be a game programmer. Then you're like, oh, there's more than like anything else, just different types of programming, different focuses. So, you know, you really st- stuck with tech. Like you said 15 years already, which it's always crazy to say, when it's when you say that. You always remember always in a job interviews like, who has 10 years of experience? So you realize like, oh, I've kind of been doing this for many years as well. When you started off when you were younger, did you have like, I mean, typically you hear like, you know, I, I mowed lawns to be an entrepreneur. I made games. Like, did you have a little, si- did you have side hustles when you were younger or did that something kind of occur to you later uh, within your career? So I, I don't know if you define this as a side hustle, but when I was young, my first two jobs, I would do door to door sales, mm. which it's definitely a hustle. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you call it a side hustle because you don't own the business, but yeah, I would go to door to door and my first job, I would sell garbage bags, light bulbs, um, like those leaf bags, if mm. it was fall. And basically the pitch was like, instead of you having to take your time, drive to Costco and buy these things, we've already done it for you. And we're just charging you like a $5 markup. Mm-hmm. And we, we always had like a standard price. So everything was $20 and then you paid us $25 and we basically kept five bucks for ourselves. And so it was pretty easy for people to understand. And it was a great job. I remember making like $250 in four hours as a kid, oh, like wow. an unbelievable amount of money. And then... Um, I ended up in a couple of years later doing a job selling, um, gas and electricity contracts. And those are much harder to sell, but on my best day, I'd made like a thousand dollars in one day. And again, I was like 16, 17. So it was a great day that day. That's, I think that's one thing like that law pe- So like early on in my career, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm like, like anyone else, like graduate university, I'm like, what? I don't know what I want to do. There's so many options. I think getting sales experience is always useful. No matter what you do, learning how to sell is like a tactile skill or a skill anywhere. And that's what I pretty much learned. Like, I guess, and you probably talked to it, like learning how to sell helps you in raising VC money, like starting a business, talking to people. Also, I think like I'm assuming similar to cold calling, no one really enjoys it. You're not like, <laughs> I'm so happy like to go door to door. Like it's very much that like mindset of like getting work done and seeing results and you can make a lot of money at a very young age which is always wild but um so i mean you do that for like did you at what point i guess did you did you start considering yourself an entrepreneur was it through university like did you have a few things you started through then or kind of when did you i guess would you say you transitioned more into where you would self realize yourself as an entrepreneur or like kind of start starting businesses even if they weren't technically businesses but kind of starting projects for yourself yeah, I, I started probably in grade nine or 10. Like once I'd learned how to code mm-hmm. and in school, they, like I'd learned Java as the first mm-hmm. language, but obviously to build websites, you go to like HTML, mm-hmm. CSS, JavaScript. So once I'd learned that, I'd build lots of websites. Now, uh, uh, like 
none of them made money at the time. <laughs> yeah. But um, I had built lots and lots of businesses. Like I had one back in the day where let's say you were a person and you wanted to create merch, you mm -hmm. could just um, connect your Instagram account. I would automatically pull the photos and stick it on mugs, t-shirts, like anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Cause like back then there wasn't an easy way to merchandise anything on Instagram. And so like I had an API where you can do this and that. Now my failure or not even failure, but my opportunity that I missed out on was marketing. Cause mm -hmm. I think the software was great. Like I think people today would even pay for it, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to market it that well. And I still don't like my, my skills are more in the business and sales side. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I personally would love to learn more on is like B2C. Because when I look at B2C businesses, I'm like, wow, how do you reach a million, 10 million, 100 million people? Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very successful at working with one person and, and you know, mm -hmm. um, creating great returns. And then I can create a great return for myself based on creating great return for mm -hmm. them, but not leverage it, you know, 100x, 1000x, a million x. Um, and then I'd started an official startup, what I would consider... Um, 2009, which was a music company. So this was like around the same time actually Spotify, I believe, was getting started. There was no way to stream music for free online. I had read that 19 out of every downloads on the internet was illegal. And so when I did it, I'm like, wow, they're missing out on 95% of the potential revenue. I'm sure they'd be happy to collect 10 cents on the dollar because then they're still getting something on nothing. Yeah. And so I went and I created a website called freeingmusic.com mm -hmm. where people could go and stream music for free. We would play ads. Mm -hmm. Artists would make money. And uh, we ended up having like a couple thousand users, a thousand plus songs. Um, and it was more or less a break-even operation. Mm -hmm. So it was a great first experience. And so I don't know if there was a point when I specifically thought I was an entrepreneur, but looking back, I would say grade nine was when I first started to explore it. That's, I, and I think that's what most people have. I feel like it's very rare. You're like, today I'm going to be an entrepreneur. It's mostly like something that continually happens. And you're, I guess looking back, you're like, oh, like, I guess that was a business experience. And I, f I find that for anything, like, especially um, if you ever have to, I know, especially like through university, it's like, when you're making a resume, you're like, what have I done that can show value? And you're like, well, I guess this experience I could write on a resume. Or like you always learn looking back, you're like, oh, that made a lot more sense. This all allowed me to get to where I am today. So computer, I mean, you, most of these stuff, obviously, so you're, you're in a tech world now, grade nine, pretty, you know, hustling your way, making a Spotify 1.0 pretty much <laughs> at so then I guess, you, and obviously most of your experience is also like the AI world. Like when you were going through universe, like becoming into a universe or that time in your life, when did AI enter? Like was AI, I mean, I guess AI has been around for a long time, especially within Canada, Canada kind of being the big proponent, especially out of the Montreal for a while. Like was there, mm -hmm. a, was there a point where you're like trying to focus more on AI or was this all kind of within the tech verse, you know, computer science world, you were you just kind of thrown into, or did, was there a point where you're like, Hey, this is an industry I want to look more into. I, I would love to say that it was a super conscious decision, mm -hmm. but I think again, it, looking back, it, it would just sort of happen. Mm -hmm. I, at the time, uh, was working on chisel and I needed a way to read unstructured data because rules-based systems can only get you so far. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the only solution really was AI and, and I've given lots of talks on the topic. I think AI is a great tool, but it's also like a black box explainability is, is a piece of AI that still is a work of, uh, mm -hmm. active research. Mm -hmm. And so don't use AI unless, unless you need to, mm -hmm. I don't think it's something you should be like super pursuing. Although people who study PhDs, more power to you. I think it's mm -hmm. a great thing. And I think you guys are pushing the field forward. Personally, I'm more interested in tech and business. I'm not married to any one technology. And I think AI is great, but by no means is it the only one that I'm looking mm -hmm. at. And I think that's so funny because I know, especially like five years ago, every startup was like, we use AI. And, you're like, and then you talk to someone who's in the computer science and then they're like, this is not AI. This is yeah. literally just an algorithm, like simplistic algorithm for matching. But they'll be like, we use AI technologies. It, it's one of those buzzwords, like you were saying, where I think a lot of times businesses try to pursue it just because it is it is cool. Like the idea behind it and like what can be done is cool. But a lot of times, like you were saying, you're really creating a very complex mousetrap that could have a very simple solution 
a lot of times. Um, and obviously, you know, and you, you brought up Chisel. Like, how did that, how did Chisel start? I I assumed it was like you were looking at AI solutions, and then you're like, oh, this is a field that could have innovation. But I guess it was the other way around. So, was that before or after Next Thirty Six? Yeah, it's so. Chisel, which originally started as, as Note, was the original name. Um, it was sort of my third company mm-hmm. um, after Freeing Music. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it had started as an app to summarize textbooks. At the time, I was a student. I was uh, in my first or second year at mm-hmm. the University of Waterloo. And I just thought it was really, really inefficient to read textbooks, especially mm-hmm. because the textbooks were all digital. And... You know, this was back in the days before COVID when we still had uh, physical classrooms and people would show up there, but the textbooks were already online. And so I said, why can't, why don't I just teach a computer how to summarize these textbooks? Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the original idea. And I worked on it for two years. It was a very successful app. It ended up going to 33 countries, 44 of the top Ivy League schools in the world, like Princeton, Stanford, Mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale. It was in Russia, China, India, Brazil, Portugal, Switzerland, Netherlands, Mm -hmm. South Africa, Switzerland, like you name it. It was everywhere. Um, And it was named one of the best 50 apps uh, for students of all time by Google. So that was pretty cool. But there was no money to be made there. And so uh, I had been working on it for two years and I kept thinking of different places to apply it. And I was invited to speak at a conference where I gave a presentation and I got an email saying, Hey, I work in insurance. Do you think this could be useful in insurance? And that was really the day that, that note sort of morphed into chisel. Um, and I went through next 36 at that time. And that was a right, right around the time that, that we were going through the name change and, uh, really a focus change. And, I'm glossing over a couple other minor pivots in the story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say it was definitely a, a personal problem, which I think is the best type of startup mm-hmm. or, or, or most passionate business that you can have. is something that you just love. And for me, it was, it was a hate of reading textbooks, which mm-hmm. I think is just as strong as a love. Yeah. Like they say, like a, a small, I mean, loss version, like a, a loss or a pain is hurts twice as much as a gain. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And obviously... <laughs> going through university, reading all those textbooks, or at least like anything else. It's like a lot of fluff in it. You're like, what, what's the point of this? So I, that's really interesting. Cause I had no idea kind of how big it was. So like when you started off the app, was the idea more just built it for yourself or were, for no, or was it more, Hey, I'm going to try to like make, like, how did it go from a like, little side thing you're doing for yourself to putting on the app stores and like getting it to grow really fast? Was it organic? Did you have like a marketing plan or kind of how did it go from zero downloads to, multinational awesome app yeah so for like initially it was just for me it was just a plugin so for google chrome uh they've actually disabled plugins i believe Mm -hmm. they now have like chrome native apps or anyways like you can't it's no longer findable people always ask me can i get it no unfortunately you can no longer i have the source code i can (laughs) use it for me um um but yeah, basically the initial version was just like a tool where I could upload my highlighted notes. And based off that, I, I learned some patterns and I could very simplistically determine what parts of a textbook were going to be important. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friends heard about it and they said, hey, put it out on the app store because I want to use it too. And at the time to put up an app, you have to pay $5 to become a developer because Google Chrome didn't want you spamming. And I remember yeah. like, damn, I don't want to pay $5 just to like, like you guys, I'm not going to make any money off this. Like, why would I pay $5? But anyways, I did it. I was like, fine, I'll put it up for you guys. So I paid $5. I put it up and it got like 187 downloads. Basically like my whole Facebook list downloaded it. They loved it. They're like, wow, this is great. And then nothing for a couple of weeks. And then one morning I wake up and I have like 2,000, 3,000 emails. Cause I would get an email every time somebody signed up. So I was like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. And then I went and it was number one on a page called Product Hunt, if you're familiar with Product yeah. Hunt. So it was on the front page. It was number 10. At some points of the day, it was like seven, six, mm-hmm. eight, but it ended up being number 10, which is still great on the front page because it goes one to 10. Mm-hmm. And so that day we got like 10,000 plus hits to the websites, 2,000 plus users. And that was really the thing that kickstarted everything. Um, and then it, it became a little bit of a nightmare of customer support. Like, to be honest, like when you have a B2C app, and you're supporting thousands of people. A lot of people have 
like feature requests, which they can conf- confuse for bugs mm-hmm. and like all these other things. And it's like, it was an interesting experience. I don't want to talk bad about it, but yeah, it became a lot very quickly, just overnight. Um, and then I worked on it for two years, like in that state as an app for students. We did a couple of rewrites. I won Velocity, which is the University of Waterloo yep. startup competition. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. Um after trying to compete four times. So my fourth time, I finally won. Uh, not to make it sound simple. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was basically something that I did for myself. Never for like gain. And yeah. like the $5 input fee was almost enough to not, not have us be here today. Mm-hmm. That's so funny. That's like always the stories where it's like, as such, like looking back, you're like, that's nothing like for what it became. But like in the moment, you're like... I don't know. Like, this is like five bucks. Do I want to spend it? Is it worth it? But looking back, you're like, wow, that was like the best $5 I ever spent in my life. For sure. So, so I get that's super interesting. So I, I think that's what you kind of touch on in the journey is I think it's very important for like a lot of entrepreneurs. I guess a lot of stories you don't hear is that like the pivots are important. Like you built, first you built the program, you built the understanding, you had knowledge and then you're like, oh, I'm pivoting. A lot of times pivots come from, like you say, you got an email, you're like, oh, I never really considered a different industry for having this. So you hear about insurance, Next36, starting to start, you kind of look, look in the industry more. Did you look at other industries as well? Or kind of what, what made insurance so good compared to some other industries, I guess? Yeah. So as I mentioned, yeah. So I think the the reason that we ended up going with insurance, and I'd mentioned this earlier, was we'd had several priv- pivots prior. So the first thing that I tried to do was the legal industry. Um, and actually not even the legal industry, more specifically the government, because the government has this process called redaction or like data masking, where under like Freedom of Information Act or like the Patriot Act or like lots yeah. of these like long keywords and acronyms that they have um, you can file a request for information from the government and they have to by law release it but they also have the right to remove information that's national security or you know hundreds of different reasons so the goal was to teach a computer to do that because the government spends a lot of money on this like hundreds of millions of dollars in canada billions of dollars in the u.s Mm -hmm. and it's literally somebody sitting there with a highlighter and a black marker and like scratching out words so I could do the same thing with my technology. If I can detect what's important, mm-hmm. by definition, just delete what's important. Yeah. Like that's it. Like, um, and so we tried that and I did get like a small contract, $15,000. Mm-hmm. Um, and it went okay. But the government is a sole pro- uh, procurer. Mm-hmm. You have to go through a very rigorous bidding process. You have to be an, an authorized vendor. There's all these ifs, ands, ors, or buts. Don't get me wrong. The, the contracts are fat. And if you can actually secure them, you'll be a very, very happy person. They're very lucrative, but it's very difficult. And we bid on a bunch and we never won. So that didn't really work out. Then I went to the legal industry. Uh, lawyers do the same thing. When you would law- have a lawsuit, you got to remove information that, that you deem sensitive and you you have to summarize lots of information. But again, they bill by the hour. So why would they want to reduce their billable hours? Yeah, That's sort of the argument that I would hear often. I think today they are using technology and there's lots of things that are different and I'm no expert, but I know back then in my experience, they just didn't want to reduce billable hours. Yeah. Um, And so the insurance industry was the first one to really pay and to really move and to really like take it up. Yeah. It was sort of try, 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 like keep failing until you don't like until you succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually like great advice. Like it, it's good that like you try different things and then you're like, oh, well, in, industry is willing to pay us. Why not go after like where the money is or at least where there is some interest? And it's really funny how like, even though like five years sounds like a short period of time, but like, especially in all those industries, like obviously now there's a lot more tech and all those things. But even I know working for other companies, like five years ago, more in the procurement and government space, like they were like, oh, we do not accept emails. Now <laughs> everything's email. But like five years ago, they're like, has to be handwritten. And you're like, what do you mean? You're like, and then they're like, well, based on this law. And then you look up the law, you're like, the law doesn't state anything about this. So I've had many things with the government or like public agencies where it's like just debating about like oh no we can't use technology it's like you said it's a headache but if you get it ton of money super good because you have to be like there's a million steps to get there but it is very difficult to enter so can you i guess you start working within the 
insurance world, kind of how, how does that start out? Like, did you start reaching out to organizations specifically? Was it like a B2B play or did it, or was it similar before where you had a software and a lot was inbound? Like, was it more of an inbound organic growth or did you really start developing a sales team early on to really try to push the tech into industry? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I think we were pretty lucky in that we were pretty early and that we were one of the first. And so there was a lot of inbound. And so um, we did build a sales team and a marketing team and all these things. But um, the very early first customers all sort of reached out to us based on hearing us speak or like hearing me speak at, at public speaking events, seeing some of our content online, reading our website and all these types of things, word of mouth. Um, and I learned a lot about insurance for sure. And and so um, I'm by no means an expert on insurance. I'd always say that to insurance people and they, they loved it because they, they're the experts on yeah. insurance and they're more interested in learning about tech, which is the, the part that I can certainly help with. And so now um, I think I mentioned that I'm, I'm working on a new business in the real estate space. And so similar thing, I have partners that I'm working with that are educating me on it and I'm bringing the tech to, to the real estate space because... Um, that's really what I'm passionate about is I just love taking complex problems and making them simple or mm -hmm. automating them or creating huge opportunities of leverage on time primarily. Yeah. So that, you know, it's so funny. I think one of the things I never realized when I was like younger in my life was like a lot of industries you take like similar to growing up with tech, like gaming and everything. And like building my own PC at a young age and like interest in programming. I assumed like, everyone had that knowledge or every industry was like very tech focused and you really do realize like a lot like you're saying before like a lot of these businesses or a lot of businesses in life can just be for sim sim simplifying tasks like you don't necessarily have to invent reinvent the wheel if you just make things more efficient and save time that is value because time is money and yeah i was always surprised by how many industries governments procurements are like very or dinosaur age, I guess we'd always say, or like archaic in the time, like bringing in technology that is maybe even like outdated in one industry can be brand new for a new industry. And I think that's oh, yeah. a lot. I think a lot of times people don't realize that like you don't have to be per se cutting edge with tech to bring a lot of value to certain industries. Because a lot of times you don't like the only complex. I know I, find, I know I work with a lot of like um, organizations. Are you still on the podcast? Where like in the data science field, and they're like, we most companies don't need like advanced AI neural networking to like look at their sales data. They just want a pretty dashboard. Like that's what Tableau is great for, like pretty dashboards. And I think that's a big thing is like, where's the value coming from? But yeah, I mean, you hit really two industries that are pretty, I mean, insurance. And I think insurance was great mostly because I think for a lot of people, like very rare people are like, ah, oh, yes, the, you know, sexy world of insurance. It's like <laughs> the hot industry. You know, that's where all the tech goes. And from a young age, my dad said, he's like, What's not sexy is where the money is at typically because there's not a For million sure. people trying to like do it, it and, but there's For a sure. lot of money there. So that's kind of funny how then in real estate, I mean, real estate's a little bit hot now, especially in Can Canada. I mean, more looking at buying a home and everyone's a millionaire apparently in Toronto, but it's, it's in a very in in interesting industry. So you, know, you, you start growing the business, like you start hiring employees from day one when it's just you, you know, you and your your laptop or your computer to having a team. What, what I guess, what was the, obviously there were a lot of changes, but were there any changes that were surprising? Like was managing a team different than you expected or were things, or what kind of, how this question tends to go is, were there things that were different than you expected? I guess that start off, yeah, were there any things a lot different than you expect? Obviously being an entrepreneur, seeing on TV, it makes one idea, but when you're running it day to day, was there something it was unexpected or more enjoyable than you thought it would be? Yeah, I think the the piece of wisdom that I had heard and didn't really internalize until I experienced it myself was that a startup isn't one company, like a startup in different phases. Like I, I would say, and I'll use my own numbers. This might be the numbers from, from the, the wisdom. It might be a mix of mine and the, but roughly like, from zero to five employees is one company. From five to 10 employees is one company. From 10 to 30 is one company. From like 30 to like 50 or 100, depending how far and how big the office is. And then like, I haven't got to experience it, but I've heard 100 plus, and then like 500 or 1,000 plus, and then like 10,000 plus, right? Because there's 
how many different offices? Do you have regional managers? Do you have regional managers for regional managers? Because the deeper the pyramid goes, it becomes significantly more difficult. It's like yeah. playing a game of broken telephone, ironically. Mm-hmm. It's like the best example I can give you. And and to maintain alignment is is a skill. And it's something that I think everybody should work on. I'm always working on because the best leaders are the ones that are able to keep the team focused and aligned. And so I think that was definitely something that was something that I needed to learn and was like something you you can't really understand how different it is from five employees to 20 employees, but it's a completely different experience. I, you always hear that. I think that's one of the thing, especially like working with a lot of small startups that people don't tend to realize until you go through it that like what gets you from like zero to you know five employees from like five to like fifth, like there's a different skill set. It's a different, like you said, different business. And I think a lot of times people are like, well, I'm success. I you know I got success early on or like the first thousand customers. Well, the next hundred thousand will be the same and it's never <laughs> the case. And I think that's, I know a lot of times, like it's a, depending on the individual, it's like, it's a little bit of a learning curve for a lot of people are like, oh, I can't, I mean, the famous like, a little bit gaming like notch in minecraft was like oh like i love creating now i have to run a business that's not what i love like i didn't sign up for this and i think that it takes a lot of um maturity to realize like oh like i have to give up some things i enjoy and maybe for, i know for a lot of people they're like oh like i also seen the opposite where they're like oh you know at 10 employees it was fun but when i had 100 like i really loved to create the culture and building out the team so i think it's like you said nine day difference. I think most people don't realize until you get there, how different a culture is. Mm-hmm. And one thing I, I used to tell people used to always say, it's like, Oh, we know we're a startup. We're lean. We're, you know, we're dynamic. We're quick. We don't have any rules. We don't document anything. And then you realize that, like at a certain point, you're like, Oh, big companies do this because you have to, like, you need to have a hierarchy. You can't have a hundred people all being by themselves. So I've seen, I've been through a few organizations where that happened, where people are like, I don't like it now because there's bureaucracy and there's like, hierarchy and you're like you need like you have to grow and you have to change and you have to adapt but it's funny how you're saying that like there's many different stages you go through and that every stage is different mm-hmm. so i guess you know within i guess it's kind of interesting like within all these you know business iterations you're growing was the i mean you talk a lot about ai or like kind of being a proponent of ai at what point is ai more than just like a algorithm so the, the, where this question comes from is a lot of times, like we talked about before, is like a lot of people say they have AI in their technology, or like this is artificial intelligence, but it really isn't. So because you obviously can articulate better than I can, like what's the difference between like a match, like an algorithm versus AI? Like what is that key difference? Like what makes it artificial intelligence versus just a Excel formula type thing? Okay, so bear with me. And maybe this is like, too specific, maybe minutia. So like, feel free to stop, but I'll I'll go, I'll take this approach, which is like AI is a field. And I, I, when I used to give this talk, um, and I had this diagram and basically artificial intelligence has seven subsections. It goes, um, machine learning is the first piece Mm -hmm. and under machine learning, there's supervised learning, unsupervised Mm -hmm. learning, deep learning, neural networks, all these mm-hmm. things. Then comes natural language processing, machine vision, um, robotics, mm-hmm. expert systems, and I think one more, which I, I'm forgetting. But my point is this. People get confused and they use it as a synonym because machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence but artificial intelligence is not a it's like a square versus a uh, rectangle. Yeah, yeah. One is the other, but one is not the other. Mm-hmm. And so um, in this specific case, artificial intelligence can just be an algorithm. Like mm-hmm. AI has technically been around since the 1970s. Mm-hmm. They're called expert systems. An expert system is defined that it does the job so well that you cannot distinguish it from a human, which is actually possible to achieve with rules mm-hmm. on a very, very well-defined task that is, um, all cases are known basically, and the inputs are expected and the outputs are defined. You can write an expert system and it is 100% artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And people don't understand that. And like, 
that's uh, that's fine versus machine learning which machine learning means by definition especially unsupervised taking huge amounts of data labeling it classifying it sometimes not even having to do that throwing it at an algorithm that will just magically spit out the answer and then you can't explain why it did it but it's pretty good most of the time and so um yeah, I, I think a lot of people misunderstand that and they, they, they'll use it as a synonym and sometimes they'll use it correctly as a synonym, sometimes they won't. But I would argue that an algorithm should be defined as artificial intelligence if you cannot mm -hmm. distinguish it from how good a human does the same job. I, I, I mean, that was a great way of summarizing it. And that's like a lot of things that I know I've done a little bit of work within the AI landscape. And it's, it's always funny how within, I mean, some of my CS classes, especially where it's like, kind of jump to the other side of things where like people think like artificial intelligence in general is a lot smarter than it actually is. And there's like, <laughs> like those four way, like the four waves and working the first or second wave, like the last wave is like robots take over the world, but like, we're still like miles away. And I think like a lot of the examples, obviously like the, the AI battle is like with like Gary Kasparov and the chess and then go recently, which was like actually apparent, like apparently the, purists say that the chess one deep blue was an ai it was just brute force but go was actually ai because it's like a, it's like a black box no one understands what's going on but you get a result so it, I, your definition was good because i think that's one of the things that people have a hard time understanding one is that how cool like what you actually can do with it but also that it's to get to like a a robot taking over the world is like not like five years away it's like there's leaps and bounds technically that are between where we are so I guess one of the things is like, you know, you've have a, you had a few startups, you've grown them, you've done a, many things within this space. This is, I hate this question, but it's always such a good question. But like, was there something that the young, like you thought when you were younger or like when you're first, you know, you had when you first startups that wasn't sure or was true? Like, would you ever have, like looking back or you're like, man, I can't believe I thought this was the case. Or was there something that was like really shocking to you? Um, that when it comes to creating a business or having success in the business that was maybe a lie perpetuated within the industry or from like what you've heard from people. I mean, it's a pretty deep question, but in case you had some key examples. Well, I, that's perfect. Cause I have a deep answer, but it's completely like parallel or tangent to, to the question in some sense. Like my answer would be this, like, I think one thing that I sort of did not wrong, but one thing that I did that maybe I would do differently is like, I went 110% and I committed everything to, to the startup, which is good and fine, but you need to also be your own person. You can't co-inflict, not, not even like your, your personality, your hobbies. Like you need to find other things that bring you joy. And I, I, I just worked so hard, so, so hard for so long. And, and I thought like money or, or like status or like these things would bring you happiness, but then Looking back now, because like I don't think I necessarily have those things, but other people might say I do. I can tell you that like that by far does not bring you happiness. And like now I'm spending more time figuring out what hobbies I like to do and things outside business. Cause I thought business was a hobby. And let me tell you, business is business and you need a hobby outside of business. That is actually the best advice I've ever heard. Cause I think one thing that I mean, I like obviously spoke to a lot of entrepreneurs and like a lot of the highly success this what I always hate hearing and i've talked to enough people to know this is not really true it's like the grind you know the grind the hustle mindset because a lot of times i mean there's obviously times to grind and times to like have those long nights but most people i know whether it be millionaire or billionaires like they always say like oh i need to get my sleep like i need my sleep i need to take time away from my computer with my family or like to have a hobby and funny enough a lot of these very successful people i found that they're as silly as it sounds like they can party the hardest not like they're partying the hardest but like they can disconnect like off their phone completely like rest. Like it's almost, it sounds bad, but they're like almost robotic where it's like rest. Okay. Now, now work rest. Like, but they can very much segment it. And I think that's one thing that most entrepreneurs I speak to, they're like, yeah, like you need sleep. Like I, I, and obviously sometimes you don't sleep, but it's like, Oh, if you're not healthy, like you have to eat healthy, live a healthy lifestyle. Cause that, transitions a lot into your business as well it's very hard i heard someone say it's like it's very hard to run a successful business if you yourself are in like a good state of mind like if you're miserable cranky tired how can you expect to lead like a group of 50 people 
So I think it's kind of similar to yours where it's like you need other hobbies because there's so many aspects to your life and it probably helps you balance it out as well. But it's, I mean, it's good. I mean, you're relatively young in your life, but like obviously quite a bit of experience that you realize like, hey, maybe there's more to life than just like constantly grinding and burning yourself out. Because at the end of the day, like I heard someone say, uh, they were like, you know, you work for like a lot of years of your life. Like you, things are going to change. Things are going to figure out, but being happy is always consistent, but you still have to work hard. I think, I think there's, it's always hard to tell us. It's like, like you say, it's like a balance, like knowing when you're being lazy versus when you're like, Hey, let's actually disconnect. Cause I, I know I found always for me, for example, obviously never had the same success as you, but I always found like when I was relaxing, I wasn't actually relaxing. I was like on my phone doing other things. So I used to force myself to like like an old person, go for a walk. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. So I started walking like every old person. But I understand why they all do it. It's such a nice, like, detox. Um, that's actually great advice. So you have success in business. You know, you're doing other things now. You help do a book as well. So, like, what other – obviously, the business one, but I know you, you said you, creating a book as well. Kind of how did that come to be? Was that, like, a passion of yours? Or was this, like, hey – something else to try out. Like how, I feel that's a quite a, not very common that tech and like literature go together. I don't know many people who kind of combine both those. How did you get into, or the idea of writing a book or kind of developing your own content like that? Yeah, I, I think I'll speak from my limited, limited experience. I don't, I wouldn't give myself like the full credit of like an author, like a, like an author who like fully writes a book. Like my experience was, Somebody reached out to us. We had a name in the space and they wanted to co-author it. And so there were a couple of co-authors on this book and they asked us to write a chapter. And so we contributed one chapter to this book uh, on the topic of artificial intelligence in the financial world, I believe, because we have some expertise on that. And so um, it came to us. We weren't the main author. They already had the publisher lined up. So I can't speak to like 99% of what it takes to actually be an author other than somebody reached out and just wanted like a chapter. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's, it's so cool. I think that's one of those things. It's always cool to say like you have something published, even if it's your ideas, because it's like that next step of legitimacy to some extent. Like I think everyone, even like I know people who are hyper successful and then they like, write a book and then they're like i'm an author and you're like you've made millions of dollars why do you care but you're like no it's cool like i have a physical <laughs> something i can show it's it's always the funniest thing when you're like All right, okay like to an average person you're like i don't understand like you made you know 10 million dollars doing this you made a th you know five thousand on a book but they're like yeah but i have a book like cool like growing up like having a book was the coolest thing so i think i mean like anything it's just kind of cool that having that experience so I don't know how much you can talk about this, but, you know, as we get closer to wrapping up, kind of, you had some experiences, you've done different things, kind of, what does the future look like for, I know you say you're looking for different things that you find enjoyment out, kind of, what does the next few years look like for you, kind of, what are the new things you're exploring? I'll start with the non-business things, because mm -hmm. I, th I think, like, that's, my mind goes, but, like, I think in five years, like, hopefully, you know, I'll be, I'll be just over 30 at that point, I hopefully, you know, knock on wood, marry maybe some mm -hmm. kids. That would be nice. I think that's definitely like a part of, of life's journey that I haven't got to experience yet, but would definitely be something that would be interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's why I work so hard and, mm -hmm. and try to try to make a good return for people and a return for myself so I can provide for others. So mm -hmm. hopefully that becomes something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, like, like I would love to have... I'm currently working, as I mentioned, on the real estate space on at least three different businesses. So one of them I'm I'm going to announce literally shortly. So I think I can talk about it here. It's called findoffmarket.ca, which is Canada's largest off-market wholesale aggregator. So mm -hmm. we have an algorithm that scrapes almost every website you can think of and finds houses that are great investments below market value that aren't listed anywhere else. So um, findoffmarket.ca if anybody wants to check that out and so that's one of the business I'm working on I'm going to build a couple more in the real estate space and so I plan to have a portfolio of real estate companies hopefully maybe a couple other investments and in companies um, and one thing that I've been wor meaning to work on recently is, is also a charity because I think it would be wonderful to give back so I'm hoping to do that this year so maybe if I talk about it here publicly 
somebody will hold me accountable or I'll hold myself accountable. But I have a couple ideas for some wonderful charities that I haven't seen anybody else do. And I think it'll be a great way to give back more than just money, tech focused charities. Cause like I said, if I can like make them a thousand times more efficient, that's better than giving them a million dollars. Right. Cause that's like every thousand dollar donation is now a million dollars. So, um, yeah, no, I'm no. hoping to give back to the community, hopefully have a family and, Hopefully have some more successful businesses and find off market is the first of them. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a great goal, great success. Story. And like you said, it's a balance. I think that's nice to hear that. It's not just like grinding for one thing. Like you have a plethora, like a portfolio of life. Like you have different things you want to work on. And I think that's cool. And I think the charity is a unique acts, aspect. I think a lot of th- times I've heard, especially from like a lot of charities, was that like a lot of people who, if you can donate skills, those are times, like you said, a lot more valuable than money because if you can, take what you're an expert at a thousand X return versus a one-to-one return, which would just be monetary. But yeah, no, it was mm-hmm. great. Great connecting Ron. I mean, I ho- hope to see your success story continue. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me.